Hello, Watch Enthusiasts. Now, over the past month, there have been various interesting uh, releases and indeed interesting auctions, and I'll try and refrain from, from talking about uh, Paul Newman's Daytona being sold, because I have mentioned that in my, um, in my, my video about the, the history of the Rolex Daytona, which I would encourage you to watch if you haven't yet seen. Um, but, however, we've seen a lot of other beautiful creations, from Breguet, for example, all the way through to Ball at various price ranges, with some beautiful technology and incredible creations. However, before I begin the video, I would like to encourage you all to join the Watch Guys, which is my group on Snups, the social media platform for sharing pictures of your collections and interests, and where you can discuss matters of horology with myself and indeed other enthusiasts, and where I'll do my utmost to reply personally to any, any questions or video requests you happen to give me. Therefore, I would strongly encourage you to follow the link down below, or download the app which is available for iOS or Android, depending on what you're using to be most convenient, and join the great many others in the group who are already using these features to really get the most out of this channel. Now, the first watch I'd like to talk about is a piece from Ball. And Ball are known, really, for making very resilient timepieces, but this may well be the ultimate field watch, because this is the Ball Engineer Hydrocarbon DVGRU. And this was designed in collaboration with the Navy SEALs to produce a, a watch which really is extremely resilient, to the, the, the daily use of, of a military uh, individual. And this watch is, uh, is 42mm in diameter in stainless steel, in a brushed and polished finish with a rather attractive bracelet as well. And here they've managed to, to make this watch resistant to 50,000G. Now that, by comparison to their usual uh, highly um, shock-resistant watches at 5,000G, is quite a remarkable achievement. And they've done this uh, with, a, a, with the use of what they call spring seal and spring lock, and these are setups whereby the, um, the, the, ca the, the case itself is lined with this elastomer piece. And this is effectively a movement spacer, and it sits between the ETA2836-2 in the watch and the case. And what this means is that when subjected to an impact, the whole movement and dial is cushioned against, uh, uh, against any, any shocks that would normally be transferred directly to the inner workings, making this watch significantly more resilient to, to shocks and bumps. Additionally, it does also feature um, a setup whereby the, the regulator assembly is, is protected uh, from shocks and therefore doesn't need to be uh, re-regulated re uh, after a bump to put it back into its original position. The watch also features protection around the crown, as you may have noticed, as there's this fold-over section which, uh, which slots over the crown and then screws in using that, uh, that, that, that synthetic uh, crown that you would use, um, which actually sits on top of the, the metal crown that actually operates the watch. And this again protects the, the crown, which is obviously a, a place of vulnerability from any bumps or, or knocks, which it would also have to, to deal with. And then, of course, the dial features something which is very much a trademark of, um, of Ball, which is to say the tritium illumination, whereby the whole dial is, is lit up by, uh, by a hydrogen-3, which is, is a, a type of, um, of radioactive isotope which is able to, to release a certain glow. Now, this watch is available in various versions, with the, um, the, the base model, if you will, being in, in, in uh, stainless steel, whilst the slightly more expensive uh, titanium carbide-coated version, which comes across as sort of a black, is, is a little bit more expensive. Additionally, the, the dial itself uh, is, is uh, optional in terms of the colours. You can have blue or black, and that last ring comes in black or orange. And this watch in all its versions will be released in a limited edition of a thousand pieces, which I think is a bit of a shame, because this really could have made a brilliant addition to the ball range, as far as a, a go-anywhere type of sports watch uh, goes, as a piece which couldn't be worn at the office, but makes a brilliant weekend timepiece. So really, Ball have created a brilliant watch here, in, in my eyes at least, because they've created a watch which really isn't derivative of any other watch on the market, and has a, a really quite uh, quite elegant and striking design, despite the fact that it's a large watch, and is is indeed not something you would wear with uh, with a suit. But nonetheless, I think they really have created a brilliant watch here, because it, it takes on the, the normal characteristics of a field watch, but uh, develops on them and really makes this watch perfect for someone who is going to use their watch as, as an out outdoors timepiece. And, uh, and is a watch which certainly does, does receive the, the usual um, uh, view of, of Ball, which is to say an interesting brand which offers uh, some very interesting alternatives to, to pre-existing models on the market from other, other brands. The second watch I'd like to talk about is a piece which I'm very intrigued by. And this is a new version of the J JLC Reverso, and this is specifically a new version of the, the classic uh, large small seconds model. And this retains all the features that would normally be there on that model, so the beautiful Art Deco dial with the brushed and textured patterned areas, with the small seconds as well. And the proportions of this watch are 45.6mm in length by 27.4mm, stretching this case out, but making it perfectly wearable for most wrists. It also features an Art Deco style dial, which is, is of course, as I've said, a, a very standard feature to have, but really is something which I feel is synonymous with the Reverso, and is something we expect on this watch. 
Uh, additionally, the, the hands are blued as with the standard version, and I think add a certain pop of colour which really is needed. However, inside the watch uh, we see the, the usual calibre 822-2 uh, with 45 hours of power reserve, and uh, is a very slim movement at 2.94mm in thickness, and runs at 3Hz. However, the beauty of this watch comes when it's flipped over, and of course with the reverso, that's one of those, um, those key features of the watch. Because behind it, it features a really wonderful little piece to pay homage to the, to, to the 100th anniversary of the De Style movement. And the first difference which suggests this watch isn't a standard version of the JLC Reverso, because there isn't any writing on the watch whatsoever to suggest this is a limited edition. But on the back you see this, this creation, which is an extremely beautiful miniature painting, and has actually required an enormous amount of work to, to produce, because straight lines um, and homogeneous colours were things which couldn't be done previously with these, these small uh, ceramic paintings. And th this painting is then, uh, is then uh, varnished um, after, being, uh, after being heated in, in a kiln to dry. But this pays homage to a painting which is very famous by Mondrian called uh, Composition with Large Red, Plain, Yellow, Black, Grey and Blue. And this is a painting from 1921, but the reason why this has been selected is because it's very characteristic of the De Style movement, which was a movement in, in art in, um, in the Netherlands in 1917, which, uh, which created these, these styles of, of art. And as a result, being the 100th anniversary, we've, we've already seen Nomos pay homage to this, um, with a slightly more subtle approach, whereas here you see a piece which is very typical, I feel, of, of JLC, with this rather beautiful approach to, to presenting a work of art in a stylized manner. And only a few people are going to be able to get their hands on these, be, uh, bearing in mind that only 25 have made, and they're only available at Steltman in, in The Hague. And this is an area which actually makes this watch strangely good value in my eyes, because at, coming in at just over €9,000, this watch is actually quite competitively priced, because for this amount of money you rarely can get hold of a limited edition of this type, with, uh, with such a limited run of pieces, with 25 being made from such a reputable brand. Which, for the lucky 25 who are going to get hold of these watches, I think this is a really wonderful watch to own, and quite a beautiful um, a talking piece, because of course it resembles a normal reverso, until you flip it over and, and can observe this really beautiful piece of, of craftsmanship. The third watch I'd like to talk about is going to come up for auction later this month, at uh, Christie's. And this is a Rolex, a Rolex Day Date 1803-9. And this is a watch which is very intriguing, because it doesn't really follow any of the lines you would normally expect to see on a day date. And this watch is, in truth, a, a white gold day date on a white gold uh, president bracelet, with a submariner dial. And the story behind this watch is quite interesting, because this was created in 1969 for uh, a client of, uh, of Klarlund, which was a, a Rolex dealer in Copenhagen. And this, this individual requested a white gold day date, but wanted something a little bit different for, for enjoying uh, his, his favourite pastime, which happened to be sailing. And so as a result, uh, he, this watch was made for him, and this was back in the days when Rolex would actually make a watch for someone um, in this way. And this is in truth a day date with the same movement inside it, the same white gold case and bracelet, but now with a submariner style of dial made exclusively for this watch, with these tritium uh, luminescent uh, indices, but with the day date configuration and those, those Mercedes style hands. And this watch is, is, is due to fetch $63,000 to $120,000 at auction. But in my eyes, I reckon this watch will probably sell for more, because bearing in mind that that, uh, that very, very rare one of two or three Rolex uh, Submariner in white gold with a blue dial and a very peculiar bezel, which came out as a prototype before the, the Rolex Submariner was actually made in white gold, sold for well over 500000 I really wouldn't be surprised if this one-off day date, which is, is truly unique um, in, in a sense which... Uh, or rather in a way which we can't normally say about production Rolexes. I suspect this watch will sell for a very high price, and uh, I, I'm, I would be surprised if it went for the, the estimate, uh, bearing in mind the, the interesting provenance and the fact that we have the full history and service history of this watch as well. I think another intriguing thing about this watch is the fact that it really does demonstrate how Rolex uh, were able to produce watches very much to the, the individual's uh, interests uh, back in the late 1960s. Because, really, I, I strongly doubt that today Rolex would be prepared to, uh, to redesign a dial specifically for an individual uh, without the inclusion of, for example, a, a new uh, gem bezel or something like that. So, I think in terms of uh, the options for this watch, or rather individual watches like this to be seen in the future, these will become very difficult to come by in terms of the, uh, the, the, the idea of having a truly custom Rolex to your, your desire. Which, again, I think adds to the desirability of a watch like this, and the curiosity it brings.
Now, the next watch in this list is a piece which I've been very keen to talk about, because I think it's, it's a fantastic depiction of how, how Breguet can demonstrate their, their, their classical charm and beauty, but while still applying this to, to a modern style. And this is the new Breguet Classique 5175, Ginza Anniversary. And this is a piece designed to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Breguet's boutique in the, uh, the Ginza district of Tokyo. And this is, is a watch which I think does that extremely well. Because it takes the grand feu dials, which are, are most, uh, most uh, commonly seen in white, but then applies it to this blue matching the strap, which brings a, a completely new character from this watch. Of course, the conventional way Breguet would produce a simple three-hand dress watch would be a white uh, enamel dial in the style of this, this grand feu dial, but in white with blued hands, Breguet numerals and hands, and that rolled, that cold rolled case, which is beautiful around its edges, which really adds to the, the, the unique nature of Breguet, because very few other brands uh, provide a, a similar style on the edges of their cases. And this, of course, harks back to Breguet's history, and, and I, I feel is something which Breguet should never lose on their watches, because it does add in, in a really significant way to their timepieces. Now, the face of the watch is extremely well executed, and as I've said, it follows that grand feu style of, of enamel dial, which Breguet is so known for. But in this case, it, it's been finished in this wonderful, uh, slightly shimmering blue, which features these these uh, powdered platinum in, uh, numerals rather going around the dial, with various symbols um, and stars around the edge to form the minute track, which uh, take inspiration from Breguet pocket watches. Similarly, as well as the large Breguet signature at twelve o'clock, we do see a smaller Breguet signature in in uh, engraved rather into the dial itself at six o'clock. And this does add to the, the heritage of this watch, taking inspiration from the way they used to do their dials, which is something which I think is, is never to be underestimated, especially with as simple a dial as this watch. And the hands are rhodium plated and follow the typical designs that Breguet always do, with an elongated second hand with, with the elongated counterweight, which I think really does add to the balance of this watch, which already with a no-date setup is, is very clear. At 38mm, the, the white gold case of this watch is still quite modest in size, but certainly allows the dial to be the centrepiece by having very slim uh, domed bezels around the edge of the watch, and then these, these delicate and, and slender style of welded lugs, which match in with that rolled, uh, rolled white gold case edge beautifully. Again, the crown is a very simple piece as well, and, and simply juts out very lightly with, with a, um, a signed uh, top, which admittedly for the price of this watch you would expect. And I think generally does make this watch uh, a piece which is extremely true to, to the classic uh, Breguet references, but works nonetheless very well in a modern way. And the movement of the watch follows the theme of a modernised style of Breguet, because it's very lightly decorated without the, the, uh, the, the great embellishment we often see on a lot of, uh, a lot of Breguets with bright golds. Here they've kept the colours fairly subdued, but still beautifully decorated and beautifully made, as is always the case. And this movement again follows the lines of being a modernised version of previous concepts, because it's the caliber 777J, which uh, stands for Japan, and it's an automatic movement with 55 hours of power reserve, and a silicon escape wheel, pallet fork, and hairspring, really bringing the watch into the 21st century, which I think is something necessary for this time, because especially since it's celebrating 10 years um, of a, a certain aspect of the Breguet brand, it was important to put a certain emphasis on, uh, on, on the, the interesting features of this timepiece. The price for each of these 10 pieces will be $27,800, which is a large amount of money, but I must say again, I feel that in terms of a collector's item, which uh, which will will be um, no doubt a watch which will appreciate due to its its rarity, this seems like remarkably good value by comparison to, for example, the one of six hundred pieces of the Patek Philippe Calatrava um, in its its aviation or pilot's uh, setup, which didn't take nearly the the changes and care required to build this watch, but nonetheless was a comparable price for a, for a far far larger limited edition. And the final watch I'd like to talk about is a really gorgeous new piece from Grand Seiko. And those who've watched this channel quite regularly will know that I am a great uh, lover of Grand Seiko's designs, and now they are an independent company separate from Seiko itself, as this higher tier style of, of watch, competing really with Rolex and Omega with regards to, to the price point, and also the technology innovations they use. And whilst I find Spring Drive their most impressive technology, there's uh, no, no denying the fact that their high beat watches are beautifully made, and really do fulfil their purpose extremely well. And back in 2014, Grand Seiko released the SBG J227, and this was the, G the, the high beat GMT, so that's a 36,000 uh, beat per hour movement, which, which runs a GMT hand as well. And this was seen as a quite impressive movement, because th this was, um, was called the 9S86, 
and with a 55 hour power reserve it was still able to run this, this extremely high beat which meant 10 ticks per second, which meant a, a perfectly, to, to most people's eyes, a perfectly smooth run of that second hand. And though there are still ticks, because it ticks 10 times a second, this was far, far less noticeable and does give a, a wonderful flow to the hand, and, um, and also does help accuracy. And this still was able to retain those 55 hours of power reserve, which is impressive considering the extra energy required to, um, to beat at this higher rate, which, uh, which a spring would normally not have to house. And just about a month ago, Grand Seiko released this, the Peacock version of this watch. And it's named that because of this wonderful dial which takes inspiration from a peacock's tail with that iridescent blue and green aspect, which I think works extremely well with a watch like this, which really does set it apart from brands like Omega and Rolex for having a completely different aesthetic and a different appeal to the, to the consumer. And the dial itself on this watch is quite an interesting affair because it's a stamped dial which is stamped in this wonderful concentric Gyoshi style which is very different from a normal Gyoshi dial and indeed very different from a sunburst effect dial which means you get this iridescence but also this texturing which really does have a, a wonderful aesthetic and I think works extremely well with this watch especially with those very organic forms and contours which characterise this 40mm case. And the fixtures and fittings on the dial are also beautifully done, with very typical and characteristic details of Grand Seiko, with these um, these these large and and w wonderfully polished and brushed um, uh, indices, as well as the Duffin hands, which are beveled to fit, to form what, what I like to call a sword edge along their edges, which really does add to the the sharp and clean aesthetic of this watch, without any of the the unnecessary details that one often sees on watches, but merely with what is necessary and is seen as functional and aesthetically pleasing. Additionally, the GMT hand in its, its subtle sword shape is matched with the GMT logo and Grand Seiko logo in gold in this metallic gilded colour, which, uh, which runs around that, so that 24 hour track around the edge of the dial, which is subtle um, because it doesn't require a bezel, but does remove the functionality of a third time zone seen on the GMT bezel. Though as, a primary, uh, as primarily a dress watch, I think this isn't particularly problematic on a watch like this. And the case is beautifully done as well, in 40mm and 14.4mm thick. This case may seem relatively thick at first, but uh, in fairness, the bezel is very heavily uh, sloped and, um, and does provide that, that additional thickness, which is often seen on these Seikos, but doesn't tend to, have to be become a problem with cuffs because of that beveled edge. And we see these wonderful polished surfaces along with, uh, with brushed sections, which break up the case and make it look like nothing really else on the market with these extremely broad lugs, which don't really add to the thickness um, in terms of the horizontal width of the watch, but nonetheless add, add a great deal to the style. And of course it's presented on a bracelet uh, with a primary setup of, of brushing, with these polished uh, slots down it, which I think again matches the style of the, the watch as a whole. And the 9S86 movement inside it, uh, as I've mentioned, has, has a long 55 hour power reserve, and runs at this high beat rate. But also we see a, a setup whereby you can adjust the hour hand independently, um, that's to say the, the standard hour hand independently, and the data is also synchronised th with this, so you can jump backwards and forwards in time without affecting that other time uh, that, that uh, other time zone hand, which means you can use that as a home time quite usefully. And it is worth noting that this watch is made of steel, not titanium, unlike some of uh, Grand Seiko's other spring drive models, for example, which are housed in titanium cases, such as the very well-known um, style of, of Grand Seiko Snowflake. And this watch in many ways presents an interesting alter ego to that watch, because whereas that is an out-and-out -out dress watch with the intention of having a little power reserve and the innovation of having that, um, that, that spring drive setup, this watch takes a far more conventional approach and, uh, and nonetheless excels at it, with a slightly different case with slightly beefier proportions, and again with this, uh, this GMT function and high beat functionality which are both features which I find interesting and I think would add to really any collection which, uh, which had one of these watches. And these watches will be sold in a limited edition of 700 pieces uh, and distributed around the world to different different retailers depending on the demand. And the price for these watches will be $6,500, which I think is fairly reasonable and actually sits alongside really uh, watches from Rolex, for example, the, um, the, the Explorer uh, 2 being the most obvious comparison to this watch um, in terms of functionality. Well, you could compare it to a GMT Master, which again is more expensive, but in many ways doesn't have the technology this watch has, um, but does have that bezel and that iconic design. So certainly it's very much what you're, you're after uh, in particular, but nonetheless I think this is a very interesting piece, and a very different piece at that. Anyway, I'll conclude this video here, but thank you very much for watching, and uh, please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and to be able to enjoy more content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Armour the Watch Guy, over and out.